Hello, hello. This is Marshall Goldsmith. I'm looking forward to being with you again today on LinkedIn Live. Wonderful program put on by our friends at Methods. They do a fantastic job of, of providing connection in today's busy, busy world. Go to methodsof.com. Our partner, Thinkers50, the one number one organization in the world for ranking and management leaders, management thinking, evaluating. And so I'm going to briefly introduce myself, my wonderful co-host, Sun Yen. She's going to introduce herself, and then we're going to begin a great show today. I'll go first. My name is Marshall. I'm from a small town called Valley Station, Kentucky. Went to school in Indiana. Got a PhD at UCLA. Was a college professor, dean. I've traveled all around the world speaking and teaching. I've coached a lot of the top executives in the whole world. And I've written 41 books and three New York Times bestsellers. And I've got a program called 100 Coaches, and my program is a wonderful idea. What I've done is we work with some amazing people, and I teach them all I know for free, and we all help each other. And the only price for anybody is when you get old, you do the same thing. Pay it forward and try to help others. And it's a wonderful, wonderful organization. And before we begin, let's my co-host introduce herself, Sanyin Cheng. Sanyin, number one thinker in the number one thinker's 50 coach in the world. Uh, perhaps in the universe, the contest hasn't been held with other planets yet, but at least number one in the world. Let's hear from my great friend, Sanya. Sanya, introduce yourself briefly and let's get rolling. Hi, everyone. I'm Sanya Shang. Uh, I'm also the executive director of the Coach K Leadership and Ethics Center at the Fuqua School of Business at Duke University, where I'm also a professor in the engineering school. And I'm also the author of The Launch Book. And I'm excited to be here today. And oh, for all of you, um, please comment and add your questions in the comments below. Uh, and we will pick questions that we will answer later on in the show. So continue to comment. Marshall, back to you. Back to me. Well, let me introduce our guests. I'm going to introduce our, one of our guests and you introduce the other one. What I'm going to introduce is a wonderful friend of mine. Uh, we've known each other many years. Lorraine, how many years have we known each other? I don't even remember. Ten? It's probably 20 years, Marshall, since we co-wrote a book together. That's how long it is. It's been a while. Well, Lorraine is a wonderful person. She is a serial entrepreneur. She's a former CEO. She's written books along the one with the one she did with me, and she's founding chair of a great organization called the Exceptional Women Awardees Foundation. I had the privilege of giving a talk to your wonderful group. It was a real highlight for me. So thank you for joining us. And, and Sun Yin, can you introduce our other guest, uh, Aileen? I'm excited to ex uh, introduce Aileen Alexander. Aileen is a pop managing partner with Corn Ferry, a global executive search firm, where she is also the co-chair of their cybersecurity practice, and she is one of the top cybersecurity and technology experts in the world. Very good, very good. Now, um, let's get rolling. I'm gonna start with Lorraine. Lorraine, why did you start the Exceptional Women Awardees Foundation, and kind of what's the gap that that's filling? Uh, it was because there were not enough women CEOs in the Fortune 1000. And uh, it is something, having been a CEO myself, that I felt was absolutely critical to enable women to rise in their careers. So I went to friends of mine in the corporate world and said, would you support a foundation whose mission was doing exactly that? And they did. And now, especially, Marshall, it is so much more important because women are being asked to play many difficult roles uh, all at once and from their homes. And so we must be there to support them to rise in their careers. And that's what we do. You know, Lorraine, one thing I love about what you're doing with your foundation is very parallel to my whole life. And it's a little counterintuitive. It's helping successful people get even better. When we think about helping others, we often think of helping poor people or people in need, and that's certainly admirable. On the other hand, what you're doing has such a huge impact in the same way that my whole mission in life is helping successful people. Our 100 Coaches Project, people like San Yen and the other wonderful people. I love what you're doing because when you help these exceptional women, you're not just helping them. They have such a huge potential shadow 
they can help thousands of other people. Can you just elaborate on that a little bit? Because I love the philosophy. That's exactly right, Marshall. And in fact, what these women do when they come into the program, they learn how to mentor and coach other women who are in similar positions. And so it's exactly like your 100 coaches idea. It's a pay it forward organization. We're all volunteers. The women who are the mentors are former CE level women. And for example, Aileen, who is one of our exceptional women awardees, when she graduates from the program, she will take on the mantle of becoming mentor to other women who come after her. And because nobody's getting paid, this is really a labor of love and commitment to the betterment of women in the workplace and in the world in general. So you're absolutely right. It has many ripples that go out and affect the woman, her company, her community, her family on every level. You know, how can the interested men and women listening to our conversation today, how can they learn more about the Exceptional Women Awardees Foundation? Well, the exceptionalwomenawardees.com, www, is our website and everything there is uh, available. And of course, they can contact you and from you, they can contact me. Um, and in addition, Marshall, I wanted to mention that we also have an exception, exceptional men leadership awardees program because women don't work alone in a single gender workplace. And we want to reward those men who work well with women, for women, and understand a multi-gender, complex and diverse workplace. And now with what we're going through in this particular crisis, we're looking at a global workplace. So people who understand how to be flexible and work with different cultures as well as different genders are critical. And so we have a program for men as well where we bring our men and women together. Wonderful. You know, and again, I was very honored. I got to speak at your group. I had a fantastic time. I've got a nominee for you. It's totally off topic. Mike, Mike Kaufman is the CEO of Cardinal Health. And I was Mike's coach when he was at uh, different levels in the organization. And he is just such a role model for a, a man who's really gone out of his way to work to help promote women in the organization. Another one, great example is Hubert Jolie. Hubert Jolie, one of my best friends, uh, he was the CEO of Best Buy. And now the new CEO is a woman. He really has worked hard himself in the area of, you know, diversity and, and really helping women get ahead. And now the organization is pretty much run by women. So just done a fantastic job. So those are two nominees that I would have for you for the men's award. Asan Yen, you have a good question for Aileen. Asan Yen, it looks like you're on mute. You're on mute. Got it. So, Eileen, congratulations on being an Exceptional Woman awardee. And when you graduate the program, you'll be a mentor to other, uh, to the next generation. So a question for you is, you also have significant military background. Uh, you were an officer in the Signal Army Corps. And how, if I were a mentee, and I ask you, how has being in the military shaped how you're dealing with crisis today? and how you lead today, how will you answer that? Yeah, thanks, Sonia. And, and it is an honor to be here with you and Marshall and also shoulder to shoulder with Lorraine, so to speak. I mean, you, you all exemplify connectivity, community, purpose, and, and a pay it forward ethos. So, so thank you for, for bringing me into the, into the fold. You know, my, my first chapter of, of my career was, was in the military as you mentioned, and then also serving at the strategic levels in, in defense here in, in the US. And I'm extremely humbled by that, that foundation. And there's a few things that experience has taught me. The first is a people first, mission always mentality. It's actually the inverse of the saying, but I, I fundamentally believe that we have, to, we have to meet people, whether it's our colleagues, our teammates, our clients, our customers, our stakeholders. We have to meet them with empathy in this moment, compassion. We have to listen. 
We have to be effective communicators. We have to be clear, candid, transparent. And, and that ethos and that framework is, is something that I'm, I've taken with me uh, in my current role and in, and in this current moment. I think the, the other thing that that experience taught me was to, to expect the unexpected and, and be whole with that, be whole with, with known unknowns and, and be comfortable with change. Uh, there's a lot of conversation now around, around the need to adapt, adapt how you think, how you operate and, and how you lead. Uh, and I, I would say that that foundation I had, I'm, I am leveraging uh, today. I think the, the other thing that I would highlight is around a concept called unity of effort. Lorraine and I have spoken about this at, at length. And you know, sometimes there's stereotypes in the military about command and control, but it's really broader of that when you're dealing with complex challenges. How do you bring diverse points of view? How do you break down silos? How do you just connect again, get back to connecting dots? Um, and I, you know, outside of your organization, I think this is something we all have to address, even within the public, private, and not-for-profit sectors in in this moment. Oh, and and I work with a lot of military generals, and I completely agree with you that it's the culture there is not command and control, but rather one of empowerment, mm -hmm. because it is a human first type of culture. And so, something you do with all of your global clients is. The big topic right now is re-entry, re-entry strategies. And so how are you seeing that human first adaptability aspect playing into the re-entry, getting back to work strategy globally? Yeah, I think we're all in it now, Sonia, working this through together. Um, you know, I think there's there's a couple ways to think about that. First is just from from a local level. Um, you know, I think we're all trying to imagine and reimagine what the workplace is going to be like. Um, you know, it's hard for me when I think about where I was seven weeks ago, walking the halls of, of my office, and it's just going to be very, very new and different. I think is we think about re-entry, we have to, to think about it from an industry perspective, a geography perspective, a team perspective, as well as an individual. You mentioned the human element, which is which is definitely going to be key is so we want to meet people where we need to meet them. Um, you know, health, safety, well-being will be will be first and foremost. But I think more strategically, companies are discovering uh, new operating models, uh, new ways to serve their clients. And uh, before we all got together here live, we talked about acceleration and how do you how do you accelerate perhaps the learnings, whether it's on the digital front or how you deliver your services front, uh, which is which is going to be important. I think the future of the workforce is something we're all talking about and and thinking through what. What are now and tomorrow skills, competencies, and capabilities uh, that we need to be uh, accelerating through and, and thinking about? And I think leadership. Uh, we've, we've always talked about adaptability and agility with our leaders, but now continuing to do that through disruption and, and not just navigating, but acceleration. Mm. Very good. Very good. Now, you know, uh, Lorraine, we did a book together on partnering a while back. Uh, and a, an important concept then, probably even more impart, important now. What are some of your reflections on the importance of partnering in today's uh, rapidly changing and challenging new world? You're quite correct, Marshall. It's become so much more important collaboration. Uh, even you see it on the uh, work from home situation that people are uh, yearning for social contact, which they can't have. And so they're, uh, they're ac actually coming together on web or video and enabling that kind of connection, which requires some collaboration. And I think people are uh, certainly in the workplace a lot kinder to each other than they have been in the past. In fact, at our foundation, we've coined the term the chief empathy officer because uh, many, if not all of our women in senior leadership bring that to the table and they have been able to accelerate uh, the, the collaborative partnering touch 
uh, because that's what's needed. People really want to reach out and feel like they are valuable and that their value is recognized. And so I think that it's a golden moment in time for the world of partnering. And there are many of our colleagues who focus on this area where partnering has become a value add and a, a significant asset for organizations that really know how to do it and are willing to accelerate their learning in that area. So I'm thrilled about uh, that aspect, not happy about the situation, but I guess there can be some lemonade in some of the areas of management and strategy. Very good. You know, Sonia, uh, you and uh, Lorraine and Eileen were all talking about some of the issues of home and especially issues around women. Can you guys kind of discuss that that we were talking about earlier? Well, I'm going to well, jump in because I'll it. take the, uh, the privilege of age to jump in, Sanya. Um, I'm, the, I'm the only grandmother amongst the ladies on this one. So um, I have four grandsons, and they're, they range from 13 to identical uh, to an eight-year-old. And, uh, of course, they are a huge amount of energy in a home. And although they're learning online, uh, the two little ones have a lot of jumping up and down to do. And it is challenging to be sure. But as a grandparent, uh, what I have tried to do is to have a uh, uh, at least once a day conversation with them. And we've been doing words that they can learn, new words, and then spell. And then I have to admit that at the end of the week, um, I actually give them, uh, I started off at $1, but they negotiated me up to $5. So um, it's been interesting to have that kind of connection. Um, I had a good experience because I don't have to deal with them when they're jumping up and down and need to run around. I'm sure that Aileen and Sanyan have had more challenges, though. Well, one of the things I was looking at, uh, even prior to the entire COVID hitting, is my next book, which is Parenting as an Act of Leadership, which looks at we're missing out on one of the biggest opportunities in leader development by not looking at parenting as an act of leadership. And right now, when our work and home lives are so deeply intertwined, that's really uh, bringing that to the fore. And looking at how what, what lessons are we learning from being at home, working with our kids, that we can then, after all of this, import back into the workplace. Um, but Eileen, you were, you were sharing with us some beautiful thoughts um, before this conversation about parenting as well and the role of parenting. Can you talk about that with us? Well, I can't wait to read the book, Sonia. So <laughs> sign me up there. Um, you know, you know, I I am really fortunate. I have, you know, twin daughters in the same stage and, and they have each other. So, you know, again, count count my blessings. And I've got an incredible teammate and partner in in my husband. So I I'm not trying to do it all. Um, you know, we're working and we're working together and working through this together. And Lorraine's called me out for my perfectionism. Uh, so just trying to do the best we can and be honest with myself my family, my husband and, and my colleagues on what I can and can't do. You know, my, uh, my father early on uh, shared with me, and this was before I had children, was that in life, um, you're gonna be juggling a lot of balls in the air. Some will be made of glass, some will be made of rubber. And just you know, really be focused on those that can break versus those that will bounce back. And I've been thinking a lot that about with my total, a lot about that recently with my total self so so intertwined and just making sure I'm prioritizing appropriately. But Sonia, I agree on the, the coachable moment. My husband, who's also prior military, uh, two weeks in to working uh, from home and together, we actually did what's called an after action review. And we had the kids facilitate and do some program management. And we did what's going well, what could be better. And they were brutally honest and we were completely humbled. Uh, buy it. So there's some learnings uh, we're all taking. All right. So free coaching for you, Aileen. Are you ready? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah this perfectionism thing. Uh, I, I did a book, Sally Helgeson was the lead author, and we did a book called How Women Rise. If you don't haven't read it yet, I'll send you a copy of it, How Women Rise. And it's a wonderful, great, well-written book. I can say that because Sally wrote the book, not me. 
So it's a wonderful book, but it talks a lot about the issue of perfectionism. Okay, I'm going to put you on the spot. Are you ready? An average day, one to 10 scale, 10 is high and one is low. What score would you give yourself an answer to this question? Did I do my best to make myself happy today? My honest answer, <laughs> probably yeah. a 1.3. Now, a coaching moment for, I, for Aileen, a coaching moment. Now, you said you were a professional, is that right? If you mm -hmm. took a test in school and got 15 out of 100, would you be proud of that score or ashamed of that score? Was it 15? Oh, sorry, Marshall, was it 15 out of 100? 13. You said 1.3, which would be equivalent to 13 yeah. out of 100. Would you be proud of that test score or ashamed of that score? Ashamed. A very bad score. Ashamed. And, you know, Aileen, that test you took in school means absolutely nothing compared to that test I just gave you. Now we're having a free coaching moment for you. Here it is. Thanks. Raise that score. Raise that score. I want to see that 1.3 go up to a nine. So you get that score All right, up Marshall. now. <laughs> now, Lorraine, is, where's Lorraine? Lorraine, are you there? I'm still here and I love what you just did because Aileen will tell you that as her mentor, that's exactly the conversation we have on an ongoing basis. So you nailed it, Marshall. <laughs> All right. Now, uh, Thank you, Marshall. Now, Lorraine, you, you're going to help her. So you're going to redo this test with her on a regular basis. And I want to see that damn score go up. And Lorraine, if it doesn't go Absolutely. up, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to criticize you next. So you've got to get that score up. <laughs> yes, sir. It's funny. All right. Now, Justin, Justin, our wonderful friend, Justin, do we have any wonderful questions from the audience? Marshall, we have a number of wonderful questions and comments. Our audience has been, uh, just, uh, lit up today with great feedback and, and comments. And I wish I could get to them all. Um, we have about three for you, so hopefully we can hit these three that uh, we've curated here. Uh, first off, uh, Veronica in San Diego is talking about empowerment. You've got Brian uh, talking about um, mentorship and how important it is, and the feeds are incredible. Just for those viewing, we stream this show live on uh, Marshall Goldsmith's LinkedIn channel, on San Yen's LinkedIn channel, and Chester Elton's LinkedIn channel currently, and a few other places as well inside the Methods platform. Uh, and so we're monitoring comments and questions from all of those locations and are looking to um, get those addressed as quick as we can. The first one I want to surface up is from Mongizi, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Mongizi is from Johannesburg, South Africa. Uh, Mongizi writes, what do you see as the shift in the role of women in the post-COVID era? Okay. Either Lorraine All or, right. I, I mean, I'll give a, I'll give a, uh, a note to that. I think it could be an opportunity. Um, now, there again, I'm an optimist. I always see the, the glasses half full, but hi there to South Africa. That's where I come from 45 years ago. Uh, I think that women will have to work um, a lot harder to make sure that their voices are heard. And I think the opportunity is that their uh, principle-based, values-based leadership um, and empathetic leadership, the chief empathy officer concept, as I mentioned, could actually be their moment, a uh, golden moment in the sun. So I think women can differentiate themselves. Uh, what they have to be concerned about, however, is that they're uh, the homeschooling issue, which is taking up a huge amount of mind share, doesn't get in the way of their careers. And hopefully once we get back to not 100% work from home, that will not be such a major issue as it is now. But I think it's an opportunity. Women partner well, generally, uh, and understand collaboration, and generally have had to work really hard to build credibility within organizations because they have a harder time many times. So I think it's an opportunity. I, I'm interested, Aileen, in what your thoughts are on it too. No, Lorraine, I, you know, well, I might be a perfectionist. I'm also an optimist. So I, 
I believe um, in this moment, and we talked about this early on, is just this human element and perhaps breaking down um, not barriers, but uh, perhaps even our own maybe self-inflicted barriers, not bringing our total selves to work. I think we're all now connecting so much more authentically. We're connecting in real time. We've got you know, kids or pets running in the background. And I, I think that's going to allow women to bring bring their whole selves to work. I, I, I'm hopeful it'll be, it's continue to be celebrated. And then also, as you noted, Lorraine, that that orientation towards empathy and, and compassion and pulling people together, I, I think are opportunities for, for all, not just women leaders, but really all leaders. Very good. Justin, what's another question? All right, uh, next up, uh, real quick, I want to call out to uh, Natasha in New Delhi, Andrew in Paris, Robert in Kenya. We've got Patrick in Dallas, Texas, and Carolyn in London, a uh, true global audience here uh, dialing in the, or commenting in. This question comes from Tree Wallingford from Raleigh, North Carolina. And women execs who have started new jobs at new companies in the COVID era, era. how can they build both credibility and new relationships via Zoom? Oh, very good question. That is a tough one. That is a tough one. And um, I would presume that uh, Zoom or, or video chat is not going to be the only way of communication. There's also the old fashioned telephone. So uh, remember that every communication you have during the social distancing area that we're living in at the moment requires a lot more thought because you don't have the personal interaction to contextualize it. So um, I am using every form of communication and sometimes just calling somebody, either video chat or doing it by phone and emailing them, just to find out how they're doing, to introduce yourself, to find out what's going on with them both professionally and personally. You can reach out with kindness and real personal person-to-person -person interest, um, and that can help. It certainly cannot uh, exchange for the kind of in-person social relationship that we're so good at, but it is what we need to do, and it means just taking extra time and care at this time. Very good. Very good. Now, we're getting very close to the end of our time. As I said, the time goes so fast. Just one final comment from Eileen and one final comment from Lorraine, and then we'll wrap up. Lorraine, do you want to go first? No, no, you go first. <laughs> Well, listen, again, first of all, it's just a, been a tremendous honor to, to be uh, with you all today, to be part of this journey with Lorraine. As she said, we're, it's a pay it forward group and we're going to continue to pay it forward. So I, I do want to close just with a moment of gratitude. Um, I'm incredibly grateful for many things in my life, but I, I, would, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge all those first responders, those healthcare professionals and others on the front lines, as well as their families. So a shout out to all of you and many thanks. And that is a beautiful thought and definitely shared by all of us. And I would say that uh, we have what we call the attitude of gratitude, which is uh, part of our organization. And I am so grateful to those within our organization and also the communities that support us. I say thank you. And also to you, Marshall and Sanyin, for bringing to the fore the most important aspect of uh, our professional lives. And that's learning from others. Thank you. Thank you. Sanya, final reflection from you. Sanya, mute button. A key takeaway for me today from listening to both Lorraine and Eileen is the acceleration of partnerships and also adaptability, right? Like partnerships require true partnerships and trust is built also on both sides or the different partners being able to be vulnerable with each other. And we're all definitely in a vulnerable moment. We need help. Um, and we can also um, share our expertise. And so this acceleration of partnerships and collaborations, it's not, it, it's not an accident that we're seeing more of that right now. And adaptability, Eileen, thank you so much for 
bringing that up and adaptability isn't just a single moment thing, but even post COVID, I hope that's a mindset that's here to stay because undergirding both the partnership and adaptability is what Lorraine said, which is learning, which is learning. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And finally, thanks to all our wonderful viewers, uh, either watching us live or watching us on the archive version. Thank you so much. Uh, our goal, Sun Yin and I are just trying to help you have a little better life in the best way we can during this period of challenge for all of us. So thank you so much for tuning in to join us. Thanks to Justin and the wonderful people over at Methods. Thanks to our partners over in Thinkers 50 for you know, just really helping pick out some of the great thinkers and leaders in the world, people like Sun Yin. So thanks to everybody. Look forward to talking with you soon. We've got an upcoming session with Dr. Jim Kim, who's one of the great leaders I've ever met, former president of the World Bank, and he's going to talk about what we can do to make basically win this battle. He's going to, it's very, very important. I think we're going to be showing it on Thursday. How can we win this battle? So Thursday, same time, really, I encourage all of you to listen for Dr. Jim Kim. I love the guy. I was his coach for many years. He is a wonderful human and he's got a strategy how we can actually defeat this virus, which I think is going to be fantastic for all of us to hear. We're going to have a special session instead of a half hour for an hour. So Sun Yin, looking forward to seeing you with the Dr. Jim Kim. Thanks to everybody and hopefully see you on Thursday. Bye-bye.